can redo the lecture again. All right, I'm starting recording on wound back therapy. Um, it's so much, pretty much what I said, more professional. It does increase healing time, exactly. And that's the main thing. So well, wound backs are pretty well used nowadays. Um, we didn't use them as much, you know, probably 10, even 15 years ago. We use them for extreme wounds. Um, but now we're starting to use them for a lot more, especially post-surgical wounds, because what we're finding is the negative pressure combined with that warm, moist environment actually causes scarring to be less. It increase, improves the healing time. It helps to draw the wound in. So we're going to talk specifically about um, one company that does a lot of the wound vacs in the valley. And honestly, if you probably see a wound vac in the valley, I'm guessing probably Alex and Kaylin said they've seen them before. Uh, I forget who else said it. But if you've seen them, you've probably seen the KCI reps delivering the wound vacs. Because KCI is probably one of the major companies in the area that actually does wound vac deliveries. Have you guys seen a KCI rep or KCI nurse before? Or you don't even know who brings it in? All the time, yeah. So unfortunately, like I said, the, the one we have signed up wasn't able to make it. But hey, we could get through this. All right. So let's go forward. So we're going to talk about the kind of the wound healing cascade and how the wound vac is going to help with that. Everyone can see the screen, correct? Well, I'll make sure it's the first time using it this way. Okay, good. I'm using the, the second screen for my little gaming setup as a second screen. So it's the first time doing this. Uh, discuss VAC therapy, missions of action, uh, basic VAC therapy settings, and kind of talk about it. So this may not take the whole class just to warn you, and I know you'll be upset about that. All right, so what are the components of VAC therapy? Well, there's a couple of different components that go along with most wound VACs, right? There's granular foam dressings, the major part. This is the part that's gonna provide direct and complete contact with the wound bed, right? So the granuliform dressing is what you can think of as that primary dressing that you would normally put in a wound. What does VAC stand for? What do you think VAC stands for? Yeah, vacuum and uh, volumetric assisted compression, I think is what the VAC stands for. It's not something you really know, they just call it wound VACs. Um, so vacuum, yes, exactly. Um, but vac is, it's volumetric assisted compression. It's basically squeezing the edges of the wounds together. That's really what it stands for. Um, but again, the granuform is your primary dressing, right? So that's the dressing that's going to go down inside the wound. With a wound vac, when you're doing a wound vac dressing with a patient, you need to make sure that is completely as filled in as you possibly can. The nice part about the wound backs is the dressings themselves can be cut completely in custom for that wound that you have. So they make really, really nice dressings. Most of them are this gray, real kind of stiff foam that absorbs the fluids really well. Then there's going to be the vac drape. The drape's going to be kind of what you would think of as that secondary dressing. The vac drape is what's going to provide that seal over the dressing so that the negative pressure can help suck out some of that gunk and provide that moist wound healing environment. Then there's going to be the part that everyone dislikes, and that's the canister. The canister is where everything that's in the wound comes out to. Um, you can imagine what the color of some of that, those canisters look like after they've been on a wound for a while. Um, it often is a very odoriferous substance that's in it that kind of gets a little wicked. The good news is those canisters are sealed. So once it collects it, they're actually kind of pressurized off and you don't necessarily get the smell of them. But the good part is we can actually send that stuff that's in the canister right from there down to the lab and they can do some testing on it if need be. Um, then we're gonna have the therapy unit. The therapy unit itself is gonna be the actual you know, control unit. So a lot of times you'll think of these, this would almost be like with your Easton unit, the main circuit board of the Easton unit would be what the therapy unit would be. And then you have the sense of track technology. This is one thing that KCI has with their VAC systems that a lot of the other ones don't have. They actually have checks and balances in the actual system that while it's working, it will detect if it's got the right pressure, if it needs up the pressure, if it needs to de decrease the pressure, and then all of our nightmares as PTs and PTAs, when there's a block in the pressure, does anyone know what happens when there's a block in the wound vac? What you hear? Have any of you guys that have been techs? Yeah, the beeping, the beeping of death. 
Um, it literally is probably next to an IV, uh, what do you call it, like an infusion beep. The wound vac beeping is probably the second most annoying beep I've heard in the hospital. Um, but it's made so that it tells us that that wound vac isn't working right. So what could cause maybe the wound vac to get blocked up? Okay, a clot of blood, good. What else? Yeah, thick, chunky, kind of gunky exudate. Yes. But more common than not, guess what causes it to get blocked up than even any of that? A poorly cut dressing. Yeah, tape in the dressing is another one, right? Anytime that somebody doesn't do the dressing nice or maybe has that little kind of tail hanging off the dressing that isn't, isn't still attached. Anytime we have those little chunks or something that we look like, if you look at your dressing and go, you know, that looks like that might fall off. Probably what's a good idea probably to do to that part. Get rid of it, right? So if you get to that point where you're looking at the dressing and, you know, it's not filling the wound better, it's a little chunk that's kind of floating around by itself, get rid of that little part because that'll get sucked up into this and it'll stop the dressing. And a lot of times, when we have a blockage that's bad enough, especially if it's part of the dressing, we're gonna have to totally undress the wound, redress the wound, and reset things up, and that can take time. And that time that we stop actually doing the wound care with the wound vac is time that the, the wound's not gonna heal. All right, so phases of the wound healing, you talked about this, right? The hemiostasis, we talked about this a couple times, but KCI likes to cover this. Hemiostasis occurs immediately after the injury. Blood begins clotting at the wound site and vasoconstriction occurs, right? That's that acute phase of wound care. Nope, I lost my mouse, there's my mouse. And then we have our inflammation phase, right? Inflammation begins right after the injury and lasts, this one, they say four to six days. Again, about a you know, week to two weeks is what the normal books will say. It's where a vascular cellular response occurs, which a number of cells, including platelets, neutrophils, macrophages, all that migrate to the wound. Do you guys remember what chemical mediators help mediate that inflammation and what causes that inflammation to get kicked up? The kinds, good, right? I taught you something, I'm proud, right? So the cytokines, your histamines, all those fun words that you think of when you think of allergies, right? They're important for making sure that we get into this inflammation phase. Can they cause you to get stuck in the inflammation phase? What do you think? Can those mediators cause you to get stuck in the inflammation phase? Yeah, right, if you have an overactive immune system, sometimes they'll send too many to that area and that will cause you to get stuck in that phase. And we don't want that. Stuck in the inflammation phase means you're not progressing into proliferation, maturation, and healing. So we've got to get out of this. So when we do wound mac in a patient like this, it's going to help manage that excess inflammation and assist wound progression. So we want to get it from that inflammatory phase into the next phase, right? Which is that proliferation phase. This is where tissue reconstruction begins, including angiogenesis, granulation, and epithelialization. The goal here with wound vac therapy would be to reduce the wound volume. So decrease the overall size, length, width, and depth of the wound, right? So remember, when we're talking about area of the wound, we're talking about typically the length and width. When we're talking about volume of the wound, we start including that depth because volume is a cubed number versus uh, area, which is a squared number. It's gonna assist in wound progression and it's also gonna prepare that wound for closure. And then we have a remodeling phase, right? Being 21 days, two years, remodeling or maturation phase occurs. So where we start laying down that mature scar tissue and everything kind of heals up. The goal of, if we get to this phase with the wound back is to assist the tissue and make sure it comes back at the right strength that it should come back. So barriers to healing. We talked about a little bit about these already, right? Necrotic tissue is obviously a barrier to healing. If we have necrotic tissue in a wound, it likes to spread and we don't want that. Any type of infection, right? So any type, especially when we get into that proliferation phase, so we start seeing that infection, we gotta watch out because that infection can throw us back into the inflammation phase and out of the healing phase. Any excess hemorrhaging or bleeding can be problems, mechanical damage, right? Anything that's not allowing, that physically won't allow that wound to heal. Uh, medical conditions, uh, diabetes is up there. What other medical conditions could affect your uh, overall healing of a wound? So we got diabetes. 
what else can affect your overall healing as a medical condition? Systemic immune systems, good, right? Good. Yeah, lifestyle, good. But I'm more talking about the medical conditions themselves. CHF, definitely, yeah, right? CHF is the big one. You'll see a lot of patients that come in coronary artery disease again, definitely. Good, so you guys got, you guys are getting this. Right? Anytime that we have something that deals with our blood, you know, any type of autoimmune, CHF, CAD, you know, even history of strokes and that can lead to poor healing wounds. So we've gotta be careful with them. So there's our vascular diseases, age. The older we get, the less we heal. Uh, medicines, especially what we are now, can, what we now call polypharmy. So polypharmy is what most patients are at this point. Polypharmy means they're coming in and that's when they take, yes, them for their medication and it comes out on a scroll that, you know, Moses would be proud of. It's six and a half miles long and they got all their medicines there. Or worse yet, you ask them for their medications and they're like, hold on. And the little lady pulls up her purse and just starts dumping out bottles everywhere. And you ask her what the medications are for, and she's like, oh, I don't know, that doctor gave me this, and that doctor gave me this, right? Because there's not a lot of communication going on between the different docs. So medications definitely cause problems. And then smoking. You know, I hope if nothing else throughout this whole program, um, even if you learn nothing else from me, you learn that smoking is bad, okay? Smoking's bad, okay? Um, smoking just it not only shortens your life, right, but it just overall causes this cascade effect on your body that you don't want. And then skin dryness, right? So anytime their skin is dry, it can cause problems. Now, some areas we don't want excess moisture, like I said, between the toes, but everywhere else we want the skin to be nice, moist, and supple so that it'll actually be functional. Mmm. Better, and it should have given you some warning for some of these pictures, but too bad. So what would be an indication for wound vet therapy? Chronic wounds are a big indication. So a lot of times we wait for wound care. Cancer kills everyone, exactly. This is, the, or at least when I was coming through wound care, back you know, when we were dinosaurs to work, um, we used to wait to do wound vet therapy until the patient was in that chronic phase. And that's a problem. Because we used to think the only thing wound vacs were good for was patients that have chronic stalled wounds. What we found now is actually uh, these uh, wound vacs are good for pretty much any type of wound that's out there as long as we can get the wound back into the wound, right? Acute wounds, traumatic wounds, subacute wounds, partial thickness burns they're great for. Dehist wounds, what's a dehist wound again? Can everyone get, can it, yeah. Can anyone give me an example of somebody with a dehist wound? I wouldn't know anyone that just dehissed their wound yesterday. I don't know about that. No idea who might have done that. <laughs> yeah. Doc Johnson was not too happy with me in the least yesterday when I went and saw him. Um, yeah, ulcers, right? Any type of ulcers. We talked about diabetic venous insufficiency. We talked about arterial ulcers. Any excess pressure ulcers, flaps and grafts, right? To help grafts heal sometimes, we'll use the wound vac on that. Or if we take a donation site, a lot of times we can use the wound vac on the place where we borrowed the skin from in order to facilitate that healing. But let's think about something real quick when we're doing a graft. One of my professors, I know, right? Um, when we're doing a graft, if we have a patient such as this one here that's got this really beautiful foot, right? I, I, I would say that something's a foot in his foot. Um, and we have to do a skin graft on that. And say we take a chunk of his, you know, gluteal fold, because that's what a lot of times what we use for grafts. What do you think the likelihood that that gluteal fold is going to heal properly? Just looking at the way the foot is. Do you think if we take a graft from that person that they're probably going to take care of that graft site? What do you think? Not likely, exactly, right? So we have to be careful. This is one of those where a lot of the docs will have to figure out is it, you know, is it worth doing the graft or is it worth getting rid of the limb? So this foot here, looking at it, what do you see is wrong? What, what do you see is wrong with this foot other than everything? What are you looking at on this foot? I'm not looking. Hey, we definitely have some blood supply issues. How do you know you got blood supply issues? 
Yeah, color of it, right? He's got an orange growing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's sloth. Actually, I think that, yeah, no, that is sloth. I was thinking that might have been uh, impregnated gauze, but I think that's actually sloth. Um, what type of wound might this be? What do you think? Okay, so I've got one vote for arterial. Okay, I got one vote for diabetic foot ulcer. This one actually is a little bit of both, just to let you know. So it's an arterial problem, but it is a diabetic foot ulcer. So this is a guy that's got a diabetic foot ulcer, but also has uh, you know, arteriosclerosis. So that's why you're seeing the color change in the foot, right? So this guy's got some problems. And you can even see that in the rest of the leg, right? If you go further up his leg, look at right where the, uh, that sulcus of the foot is, where that, the, the bones meet the, the ankle bones. Right, so let me get my little drawers up here. Here, move my mouse around. So go over here. If you look up here, you can see even that's not healthy tissue, right? Obviously, we got some problems here, and we've definitely got a problem here, right? And we got some stuff going on over here. So all that stuff's gonna have to be. It looks like it's moving. Ooh. It's coming after you, right? It's like the uh, the monster from, oh, what was that? Uh, Spaceballs. It's going to start coming out and singing at you. Um, so looking at that, what kind of stuff are we going to have to do to this wound, do you think, before we even think of putting a wound back on it? Hello, Clarice. What kind of stuff are we going to have to do, do you think? Think we're going to have to clean the wound a little bit? Yeah, clean out as much as we can, right? Here's, here's the thing, that sloth that's in that wound is probably in there for good. We're probably going to have to use a little bit of enzymatic debrider in there, right? Yeah, we're definitely, especially if we look, annotate, over here where all this dead skin is, right? We even need to get rid of all that. Why might we want to get rid of all that dead skin over there? Yeah, it might lead to infection. It might also grow necrotic and we end up if you can see right up here at his toe, you see he's starting to develop another pressure injury, right? We may have to, you're right, Ashley. Um, so up here at his toe, we can see dark colored skin. What kind of pressure injury do you think we'd call that? So we, got, we can't see, there's no open wound. Yeah, suspect the deep tissue injury, right? We're worried about that developing into something worse. Um, I know a lot of the docs I work with would probably look at this and go, you got a choice. We can either amputate the foot now, or we can wait six months and give you a transtibial amputation. What do you want to do? Because they know point blank, the patient's probably not going to take care of this foot, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely highly recommend amputate. I am not a doctor, but I'd say amputate that foot. So, ooh, another one. So what are some contraindications of ACT therapy? Well, we're not going to want to do it in exposed blood vessels, animistic, animistic sites, organs, or nerves. So if you've got exposed any of that, toes aren't even black yet. He's good. He's seen worse in the valley. I love it. I think that actually was a person for Valley, just to let you know, Alex, but I can't guarantee that. Um, but yeah, so anytime we've got something where we've got exposed nerves, exposed organs, <laughs> that'd be really bad, or blood vessels that are just growing in, we obviously don't want to go ahead and put that wound back on because we need those areas to kind of seal off first. Let's just think about it. If we have something where maybe we're back at the back of the elbow, where we have that cubital tunnel, Right? What nerve passes through the cubital tunnel? Very good, old nerve. Excellent. Good job. Bonus points there. And this is like uh, whose line is it anyway, and bonus points don't matter. So the owner nerve passes back there in that cubital tunnel. So let's say we've got a wound back there in that cubital tunnel. And then we decide, hey, we're going to try some back therapy back there, but we can see that owner nerve. 
And then we're going to put suction on it. What do you think that's going to feel like? Yeah, I'm guessing probably not. It may be fun for you, but I'm guessing it's probably not going to feel so great for the patient, right? Or if we have exposed blood vessels, we're going to stretch those blood vessels. We definitely don't want to work with that. Obviously, if we have a wound back that their organs are exposed, or we have a wound that our organs are exposed, I'd assume we have bigger concerns than putting a wound back on it. No pain, no gain. Uh, so contraindicated patients, then any malignancy of the wound. So why, if we have cancer, might we not want to put a wound back on it? Specifically cancer in the wound bed itself. Yeah, right? So if we start sucking on that cancer, we can cause it to apoptose, right? Split apart. And we know that once it starts splitting apart, it's going to go everywhere. Untreated osteomyelitis. What's osteomyelitis? I know, I think one of your groups did something for Dr. Reston's class on osteomyelitis. What is that? Yeah, bone infection, right? Good. Definitely, definitely don't want to do that. There are warning sections for osteomyelitis, but again, that's going to be one that probably we're not going to deal with as PTAs. Um, any ex unexposed fistulas and necrotic tissue with eschar present. If there's eschar in a wound, we need to get it off. We have to get all that eschar off before we can go ahead and do the wound back therapy, right? And a lot of times they have sensitivity to silver because a lot of the dressings, specifically the granuform silver dressings, obviously have silver in them. I don't know why they would. I mean, it just says in the name. But if they have sensitivity to silver, obviously we don't want to use silver dressing on them. I forgot to mention that in the dressings themselves. Um, but if your patient may be as sensitive to silver, probably don't use silver in their wound. Um, Bleeding, right? With, with or without uh, VAC therapy, patients are at a high risk of bleeding complications. So we've got to be careful with this. Any patients that have weakened or friable blood vessels and organs around the area of the wound but are not limited to suturing the blood vessels, infection, trauma, or radiation, we have to be careful. So here's the deal. This is a warning. This is not a hard contraindication for patients that have an increased risk of bleeding. Who's going to make the decision if we can do wound VAC therapy on a patient that might have risk of increased bleeding? Is it going to be us? Preferably the PTA, and a lot of times it's going to be the wound vac specialist. Because a lot of times, yeah, thank goodness, exactly. Uh, I'm, that, I'm glad to abdicate that responsibility. I'm just saying. A lot of times, you know, the, the wound vac specialist is going to consult with the PT, and the PT is going to say, hey, I've got this patient. This is what they've got. What do you got for me? Right? And then they're going to decide, you know, what's going on. If active bleeding suddenly occurs in large amounts during VAC therapy, right, immediately stop VAC therapy. So if all of a sudden you're looking at that wound VAC and there's gobs and gobs of blood in it, right, is there going to be some blood in a wound VAC canister anyway? Yeah, it's going to have a little bit in it, right? And you'll learn over time what's a little bit of blood and what's a lot of blood. But if you look down in that wound VAC canister and it's primarily blood, you probably got some problems. And you might want to get the PT. But if you notice, it says stop the wound back immediately. So that's not one where we're going to be, hey, you know what? That doesn't look right. Let me go get the PT or the nurse, right? You want to stop the, it's not going to kill somebody if you stop wound back therapy for a few minutes. Stop it, get the nurse, get the PT, get some help. Just be aware of that, right? We're not used to prevent or minimize or stop vascular bleeding, right? So if the patient has uncontrolled vascular or vessel bleeding, wound back therapy can't help that. And honestly, a lot of times those patients that have vascular bleeding, the only way they're going to be helped is surgery. Um, I can speak, again, from experience with my ex-wife. Uh, my ex-wife, when we first moved out here to Vegas, you know, she went out riding four-wheelers with a bunch of people she met in her lupus group and rolled the four-wheeler over on top of her. Um, and, you know, put this in perspective, my ex-wife was 5'1", 90-ish pounds, and the four-wheeler landed on her. And she was up in the dunes north of Vegas. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for a couple of weeks, she, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of days, she was complaining about pain in her pelvis, and I thought she just had a fracture. Turned out she had popped about five major blood vessels in her pelvis, and her pelvis, the entire pelvic cavity was filled with blood. It took me about two or three days to convince her to go to the ER, and then she spent the next six hours in, e in emergency surgery. So VAC therapy wouldn't have helped that, 
right? You don't want to put it over an open bleeding vessel. They've got to go in and usually do a star closure on it. All right. Protect vessels and organs. All exposed or superficial vessels and organs around the wound must be completely covered and protected prior to the administration of VAC therapy. Um, this just kind of makes sense, right? Any type of large wounds that have hidden vessels, anything like that, you need to protect those. So the main idea here is if you're gonna have a patient that has exposed vessels in that, the treating physician should be the first one to put the VAC on. They should be able to look at it and tell us, and a lot of times they're gonna put it on in conjunction with the PT. And if you're ever concerned, you're like, I'm worried about doing this, ask the PT for help. If you're gonna do wound care, trust me, you're gonna get really, really close with your PT because they have to trust you and you have to trust them to make sound decisions. So honestly, it's, you get really close. Um, I, I know most of the wound care therapists in the Valley and they really are big on making sure that they have good interaction with their PTAs. Uh, infected blood vessels, right? Anytime we have infections, we gotta be careful. You know, if we have an infection that can cause problems in that wound bed, may not want to do wound back therapy, but again, it's going to be a warning, not necessarily a hard contraindication. Um, any type of problems with the actual blood itself with clotting, right? So any hemostasis, anticoagulants, or, you know, platelet aggregation, so those clot busters, we've got to be monitoring them constantly. Let's think maybe a patient comes in because they had a stroke and we knew it was ischemic. So what medication did they give them? You remember the three initials for the medication? TPA. Good. All right. The MTPA, but when they had the stroke, they fell down and split open their hip for about six inches down the hip. We've got to be careful. We could do wound back therapy on that. It could be really successful. But the TPA has now set them up that they're not going to clot for quite a while. So that's going to be one of those PT considerations where do I want it to use this or what do I want to use in this case? And maybe that just for a while until we get them off that TPA peak curve, a peak part of their uh, medication, we're just doing regular traditional wound therapy until we can get to the point where we can close that off with a wound back. Um, any hemostatic agents applied to the wound site, right? Anything that's not sutured, bone wax, gelatin sponge, spray sealant, anything like that can pop open and then increase the risk for bleeding. So again, the main idea here is anything that can cause bleeding to increase in the area, we really have to be careful with the wound back. Uh, sharp edges. Uh, this sounds kind of self-explanatory, right? If we've got exposed bone with sharp edges and we start sucking on it, you think it might be a chance that it might puncture the wound back? Or at least a secondary seal? Yeah, definitely, right? This would be our uh, traditional, what's our traditional contraindication we talk about? When we're dealing with comps, our unstable fractures, right? Anything like that, we've got to be careful. Um, and then being careful using the large canister in patients with high risk of bleeding, right? So typically in somebody that's got, you know, a really bad chance of bleeding, we're going to use a smaller canister because we have to change it more frequently. Whereas the bigger canisters we usually use in the acute care hospital. Why do you think we're going to use the bigger canisters in the acute care hospital and maybe the smaller canisters in home health setting or in even outpatient wound care? What's different about in the acute care setting versus at home? What do they have constantly? You have no doctors available, and they have constant nurse supervision, right? So that if they, the nurse comes in, you know, comes in to give them their medication, suddenly they look down at that thousand milliliter canister and realize 775 of it is filled up with blood. They have a greater chance of getting immediate care, whereas if they go home, a lot of times patients, I'll be honest, a lot of patients don't even look at their canisters. They'll wait, you know, whoever comes in and does the wound care change on them, they'll let them deal with it. So if we send them home with a big cancer that's, you know, sucking them dry, it can cause all kinds of problems. So just be aware of it. That's a large loss of fluid volume if they lose 1,000 milliliters. Uh, infected wounds, we got to monitor carefully, right? Mainly because they can increase the wound conditions and may reduce overall function. So we have to make sure that any type of systemic infection coming from that wound site needs to discontinue the wound back therapy and contact the physician, 
right? Because think about it. If I get a staph infection in a wound, is it pretty easy for that staph infection to spread through the blood? What do you think? You know, sometimes I miss staring at your faces. What do you think? Do you think that if the patient's got a staph infection in the wound, it's easily to spread through the blood? Yeah, right? And what's it called once it jumps into the blood? What's that condition called? Sepsis, right, or septicemia, good. Okay, good. Um, we may use a granular foam silver dressing in these. Again, a lot of times we're gonna use silver in wounds that have infections because it's bacterial cidal, right? And it's just, it's a good thing to help get rid of some of that infection. Osteomyelitis, we talked about already. Any expense, exposed tendons, ligaments, or nerves, we should kind of think about before we put suction on them. And this goes without saying, but use dressings from a sterile package, right? Don't be sitting there thinking with your patient, oh, I've got half of a package of vac foam from the last patient. I could use that on this patient. That just doesn't even sound like a good idea, right? Yeah, that's exactly, yep. Yeah, that would, what's that? that would just basically be a fistula, right? Especially one that we can't see where it goes to. Yeah, because think about it. Let's say that I've got a, maybe it's, let's say I've got a wound in my groin, right? And I'm doing vac therapy on that wound and I've got an unexposed fistula that runs up into my abdomen. We apply that vac system, we can end up sucking down part of the intestine. Right, so we definitely want to be careful anytime we have an, a fistula, especially when we don't know where it goes, or even just a general tunnel that we don't know where it goes. We typically aren't going to do wound therapy until we uh, check where it is. Here's the neat thing about the vac foam dressings. They're radiolucent, which means they're not detectable on x-rays. That's both a good thing and a bad thing. Because I've seen patients that have had chunks of that wound vac foam stuck in their wound bed because somebody didn't take all of it out. And we really have no way of knowing that's what's causing the infection until we open them back up and find it. Um, that's why I also like the sponges. If a doc is doing surgery and leaves a sponge in a wound and stitches you back up, until we cut that back open, we're not gonna know it because they don't show up on x-rays, right? Now, if they leave a pair of scissors in your wound, obviously those will show up on x-rays. So we kind of can find that out. Uh, foam dressings are not bioabsorbable, right? So we always count the number of pieces going into the wound and we count them going out. So if we put 15 pieces in the wound and then we change the dressing, how many pieces should come out of that wound? 15, good, right? That's the key thing we wanna kind of focus on. We need to know when we change the dressing, have we gotten everything out? It's just like regular dressings too. We did regular wound dressing. If we put nine four by fours in, nine four by fours should come out. We don't want to leave any old dressing in that wound. That just opens an area for infection, right? And then obviously we talked about if any type of bleeding occurs, we may need to stop it. Um, never leave a vac dressing in place with act without active vac therapy for more than two hours. So this is what I was talking about. If you have to stop vac therapy, Oh, I asked if we put 15 pieces of dressing in, how many pieces should come out of that at the end when we change dressing? 15. The film isn't biodegradable, which means, the foam isn't biodegradable, which means it's going to stay in, it's coming out. Whatever goes in is coming out. So this is what I talked about. If, you know, you suspect something or a problem with that vac and you have to shut that vac off, you've got about two hours of time until you have to turn that vac back on. So you do have some time if you need to go get the PT. It should not take you more than two hours to find somebody to ask about a wound. I'm just saying. If it takes you more than two hours to find the nurse or the PT, um, yeah, we got some problems. So acrylic adhesive, vac drape has an acrylic adhesive coating, right, which may prevent the risk of adverse reactions of patients. If they have any type of hypersensitivity to adhesives, we may have to not use vac therapy. So we have to be aware of what their type of um, allergies and stuff they may have. I have yet to encounter a patient that has any allergy to the VAC adhesive, now the normal tape and stuff like that all the time. I encounter patients all the time that 
you know, we use cotton tape with this patient and the other type of tape, the vinyl tape with this patient. Just depends upon what their skins are. Um, remove the vac dressing if defib is required in the area of placement. So let's say we have a wound vac on a chest wound, right? What might cause us to have a chest wound? that we might need wound vac therapy. Surgery, okay, maybe, yep. Trauma's the big one in this area. Heart surgery, not so much, because we get there's, we don't do too much. I think about it, I'm trying to think if we actually seen any wound vacs on heart surgeries. I don't think I have. But especially in this area, gunshots, right? I, I've seen a lot of gunshots in this area. We will do wound vac therapy on because the gunshot, you know, yeah, in this area, exactly. Well, actually, in my area, too, where, the, when I came, where I came from in York, Pennsylvania, was the second highest crime rate in Pennsylvania. So I saw a lot of gunshots there, too. Um, but, you know, gunshots, especially traumatic gunshots, where it's not something where it's just in and out, where that, that, gun, that bullet goes in and bounces around a good bit, that wound takes a while to heal. So a lot of times we will do wound back therapy with them. But let's say we've got, you know, a... a a wound vac in the upper right quadrant of the chest. Before we go ahead and do defibrillation because the patient maybe is having a heart attack, we probably want to remove the wound vac. Just saying. Probably not a good idea to have something sucking on their chest while you're shocking them alive. I mean, I don't know why that would sound so odd, but. Um, the, yeah, the MRIs. <laughs> this is funny. I don't know why we have to say this. So if I say, don't take the wound back into the MRI, that should be pretty self-explanatory, I would think. But being the fact they had to warn us about this means that somebody put the wound back in an MRI. This is, goes back to that warning coffee may be hot. We have to play to our least common denominator, otherwise, you know, People do stupid things. So the dressings can remain on, but we definitely don't want to go ahead and put the, uh, the wound back in. Ideally, you don't want to take the vac therapy in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You can go ahead and discontinue it for that. You remember you got that two hours, so you can shut it off for some time during you take it off. Um, they do say it's considered a fire hazard because it does have mechanical movable parts. So that means there's a chance that you go in there and you've got that machine running and the area is flooded with oxygen and well then boom. And we don't want to do that to patients. We try to keep boom away from patients. Continuous versus intermittent, right? Uh, well, it depends. Lately, I've been seeing a lot more and us, the people that have seen the wound vaccine, have you guys been seeing more intermittent uh, wound vac then continuous inter continuous wound vac therapy. Have you guys noticed that or you have no idea? Mr. Alex, who knows everything. Continuous always. Wow. Seems like we're getting more intermittent because a lot of the studies and everything are showing that intermittent therapy is actually better um, because it allows... Now, if you have something like an unstable wound or anything like that, obviously continuous is better. But... Intermittent allows the body to kind of naturally go back to normal shape and stuff like that. So there's some that says intermittent may be a little bit better. We'll talk about that in a bit. Size and the weight of the patient should be considered in prescribing wound back, right? We don't necessarily want to put an adult machine with adult pressure on a pediatric patient. Shouldn't have to say that. Patient experience autonomic dysreflexia. What should we do? Stand the check catheter, good, right? Maybe a good idea to stop the wound vac at that point. Do you think the wound vac could be the catheter you have to check? What do you think? Yeah, right? It's going into the body and it's creating a hole, right? So that could be the catheter you have to check. And I've had it where I've had a spinal cord injury patient on a, on a wound vac, and one of the first things we do is shut the wound vac off, and all of a sudden, the autonomic dysreflexia resolved just by shutting the wound vac off. 
Well, that told me the cause of that hyperreflexia was the wound back. And we have to look at the way the wound back set up then. Um, yeah, here's again, another kind of duh here. Don't put the wound back in proximity to the vagus nerve. Like, can't believe we have to say that. Just saying, right? It just, it kind of goes without saying that if you have an exposed nerve, it might not be a good idea to put a wound back over it, especially if that exposed nerve might control, what does the, the vagus nerve control? Breathing, right? Organs, yeah, controls your organs, controls your heart rate. So definitely we don't wanna go ahead and uh, <laughs> put it back and start pulling on it. That just sounds stupid, right? And so here, you know, any type of fistulas that require special precautions. So anyway, if we know that a fistula is there, right? Obviously, we're going to typically discontinue fistulas, right? So fistula is an abnormal connection, right? So it can be between two functioning organs, two functioning cavities, anything like that would be a normal fistula. So we have to be careful when working with those because we don't want something to go ahead and suck an organ down where it shouldn't be, right? Technically, would an ostomy be a fistula? Yeah, technically it is, right? So anytime we have stuff like that, we have to be careful with what we're doing. Um, and again, if we have fistula, that's gonna be mainly dealt with the PT. We're not gonna have to worry too much about it, let them handle it. Um, but anytime we start seeing, especially if we're doing wound care after effects, so maybe we take the wound back off and we notice we've got a hole going somewhere, we don't know where it goes. That's probably time to go get the PT. Uh, protect the peri wound area. So when you think about it, if we've got some constant suction going on that peri wound area, the peri wound area is going to kind of suck inwards. It can also dry out. So any type of irritation or sensitivity, we got to protect, right? We may have to use some form of a, you know, a skin barrier or something to help protect it as we do it. Circumferential dressing, right? Anything that goes over it. Um, anything to secure the dressing. And this includes even down to some of those, like we talked about that, that uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, I'm trying to blank right now. Oh, the liquid skin. You got to be careful even with that in these patients. So we just want to make sure that, you know, with wound care, we're doing it with just a small wound of what we need. Um, excursions. In rare instances, tubage blockage with the vacuum result in a brief vacuum excursion of more than 250 millimeters of negative pressure. Yikes. So all of a sudden the vacuum starts sucking up and gets a blockage and for a few moments, it's going to drastically increase the suction. Why is it gonna drastically increase the suction? What's it trying to do? Yeah, pull it through, right? Sucking it up. It's trying to use the suction to improve the, the flow of stuff. Well, time being, when it does that, it's really increasing the suction on the wound. If it keeps doing that, discontinue it. Uh, dressings do not use topical solutions or agents that may have adverse reactions to silver. For example, saline solutions may compromise the effectiveness of the granule foam dressing. So saline inside the wound, okay. Around the peri-wound area, maybe not. So that's where you're going to have to go with what they say. And then for maximum effectiveness, the granule foam dressing should be applied directly to the wound surface, right? So you don't want to put it in contact with blood vessels, all that good stuff as well. Uh, electrodes are conductive gel. Don't use electrodes over the area you're doing wound back therapy on. Just makes sense. Um, certain dressing, especially the grain form silver, can impair visualization with certain imaging modalities, so just be aware of that. And then the dressing contains an element of silver as sustained release formulation. Just understand that it has some metal in it. So all these warnings and everything, anything different like that, the product will tell you what you're going to do, but let's look at these. What makes it different? Well, the application of this negative pressure increases physical response. The physical response is what they call the macro strain response. And it also increases the biological response, which is the micro strain. So literally saying that there's gonna be physical aside where 
The wound edges are drawn together. It removes the infectious material, reduces swelling, and promotes perfusion of blood vessels, meaning it increases the overall blood flow in the area. At the micro stain, strain level, right, it shows that the foam contact tissue under negative pressure creates a micro deformation, which leads to cell stretch. With the cell stretch, they're able to absorb more water, right? And it allows greater granulation tissue formation. So overall, it's gonna have a six, you know, six style effect on that wound itself. So it's, there's a lot of studies have shown this is the way to go with large wounds. Um, contracts the wound under negative pressure, drawing the wound closer, right? We want that approximation of edges and that can heal things. It provides the complete and direct contact of the foam with the wound surface. So as long as we've got the wound completely filled in, it'll do it. It removes that exudate, the edema, and promotes local perfusion, which we already talked about. So studies demonstrated the effect of biological response. When we do this, that stre cell stretch, when we stretch out the cells, we have increased their ability to absorb fluid via osmosis, right? They're stimulated to grow, right? Especially with granulation tissue. So this forms that healthy granulation tissue in the wound bed, which is what we want, right? We want that red beefy kind of hamburger-y like tissue that be in the wound bed. And then we've got the sensor track tubing and padding, right? There's individual senses, sensors in the lumen. And the lumens are the tubing inside the actual vessel, right? Your lumen are your blood vessels, so the, the walls are your blood vessels. There's software that controls and maintains the negative pressure. So it'll help increase the suction as we need it. If there's a blockage, it'll decrease the suction if we detect that suction is too great at this point. If it's a consistent target pressure that's not met, there'll be an alarm sounded. And that's so that you go check it, right? If you know this patient's got a wound care, uh, wound back, and you hear that alarm going off, that's not time to ignore that alarm. Stop in and check on it. And there's a seal check. Initially, when we set everything up with a wound back, the first thing it does is goes through a seal check and tells you, did you seal this wound effectively? And if it didn't, it'll tell you, and then you've got to go back and redress the wound. This is kind of that easy purge technology. This is the actual suction part that goes over it. It provides the sense of track with active constant affection or constant feedback, telling it if it will actually go ahead and remove that fluid and gunk that's in there or if it's gonna get blocked up. The exudate removal is the big thing, right? We wanna get anything that's not supposed to be in the wound out of it. So initially we talked about versus intermittent compression, right? So I said that I'm seeing a lot more intermittent than, you know, uh, what do you call it? Yeah continuous. And the main reason I'm seeing a lot more of the intermittent is because I don't really see them in the in inpatient world anymore. I see them a lot more in the outpatient world. So obviously, I'm seeing more intermittent. So usually, and that's why Alex said he saw all uh, static or continuous, what's because he's seen them in the hospital. So the key thing here is dynamic pressure versus intermittent or versus continuous pressure. We're seeing a lot better reduce uh, a reduction in overall wound sizes and stuff like that by doing intermittent. But continuous therapy, obviously, for the first 48 is what they're indicating here, especially if patients are at an increased risk of bleeding or may experience significant discomfort with intermittent. When it's intermittent, it's going to go on and off, right? Um, especially if there's other this. If it's difficult to maintain an airtight seal, especially around the peri, anal, or toe wounds, that just sounds fun. So here's the different types of dressings we have. We have the black dressing, which is your typical dressing you're going to see. It's hydrophobic. So that means it doesn't like to absorb a lot of the fluid. So that's going to allow it to pull through, right? We have the white foam, which is hydrophilic, which does help absorb a little bit. It's pre-moistened with sterile water. It's a little denser foam, but they're used typically when we... So the top one is your everyday dressing. So let me get my little annotation here. This one's kind of the one you'll see almost every day, the black. The white allows us to donate moisture, right? So that allows us to put wounds in with a little bit of sterile water in there so we can help donate moisture to the wound bed. And then why would we use the silver dressing again? Yep, infection, good. Yeah, so Mike, definitely, it's absolutely normal for home health patients to have a wound back. Usually they're gonna have all the training on it while they're in the hospital. And again, 
most of their training is going to be on what do they do if they get a blockage? Because a home health care, either nurse or PT or PTA, is going to come every so often to change dressing for them. So again, black, traditional. This white is traditionally if you need to increase, right? So increase the moisture. And then the silver is if we have suspicion of infection, right? So any of those can be used. The good news is all of them are compatible with just all forms of their wound vacs. And the wound vacs will adjust automatically based upon what they're feeling being sucked through, which is actually kind of cool. Let me get rid of my pen. Let's take a quiz here. I know, right? God help us. How many mechanisms of actions are there that the wound vac provides for? I got a six, I got a six. Do I have a third six? All right, I feel better now. Oh God, and I'm 666. Six, six. I was just listening to that a few minutes ago. The Heretic's Anthem. Oh, look at how fancy it is. There are six different strains. All right. Which of these are VAC therapy indications? What do you think? Okay, so I see an all. See an all? Right? Yeah, it's all of them. What about some contraindications? Well, contraindications, again, we talked about malignancy, untreated osteomyelitis, anything where we've exposed fistulas. If we have necrotic tissue, what do we have to do before we can use unstable fractures? Good. If we have necrotic tissue, what do we have to do? Debride it. Take it out. Yeah. So even if we have like on uh, Seymour, where he's got that chunk of necrotic tissue in the corner, we can't get a wound vac seal over that. So that has to come off before we could do it. And honestly, Seymour's wound is ideal for wound vac therapy. Even that surgical uh, incision on the side, they're perfect for wound vac therapy. We're just gonna pump that full of that you know, black foam, hook up that suction, and it's gonna constantly flood the area with you know, sterile fluid and clean it out. All right. How long can the vac therapy be off before we have to change the dressing? Fantastic, two hours, yes. Right, no more than two hours. Anything over that, we gotta change dressing. So let me ask you if maybe you come to a home health setting and the patient's got a wound back and you come in and you notice that the machine is off, but the wound back is still attached. What should be the first question you ask the patient? Other than what the heck are you doing? How long has it been off? Yeah. Right, because that's an important thing because they're like, oh, it just shut off, maybe the battery went dead. Here's the deal, if patient says it just shut off, you may wanna think that it's been two hours and just changed the dressing. I'm just saying, because just shut off to patients could be yesterday. So be, especially during this, uh, what do you call it? This whole locked in phase right now. I mean, I'm seeing patients, I, I, a couple of my kids when I'm talking to their parents are like, I don't even know what day it is anymore. I don't know if you parents that are out there feel that way, that you're not sure if it's what day it is and if it's day or night most times. Um, you know, I'm hoping that some of you are still maintaining your sanity. I don't know if kids feel that. I tend to look outside to see if it's daylight or dark. And most of the time they look out, it's dark, which scares me. Um, that means... I'm not awake during the daylight hours anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, so definitely ask the patient. We need to know about that. Why do you think we're going to use 125 millimeters of mercury for it? Why do you think we're going to use 125 millimeters of mercury? Because that's the standard pressure. Does anyone have a guess? Similar to body pressure, good, right? So if it's similar to bodily pressure, you're right, Melissa, exactly. If it's similar to body pressure, right, it's gonna increase that peak flow of the capillaries. So Alex had the right thought process and then Melissa finished it out. 
right? It's really close to that blood pressure of the body, so it's normalizing and improving that capillary peak flow, right? How does the materials change like hands? So how does your red blood cells and all the materials change hands so it gives the food and everything to your cells? Does osmotic transfer, right, out at the capillary end? So by pulling just a little bit above that blood pressure can help overall expand those capillary beds and helps improve that capillary flow so that everything can flow from side to side a little bit easier. When might we do white foam? What do you think? This one's kind of not covered. So we're gonna talk about it's typically two and four. So let's go back. So two is deep undermining, right? So if we have to get something underneath, why do you think we might want to put the white foam into that deep undermine? Yeah, exudate, it's moist, right? Yeah, and it won't get stuck. If it's moist, it's less likely to get stuck in that undermining. Same thing in a tunnel, but honestly, what might be the warning about the tunnel? What do we have to watch about the tunnel? If, especially if it's a tunnel that is new. Yeah, depth, right? Or if we just don't know where it goes. If it's just a tunnel we go in and it's about a millimeter long or you know, even two centimeters long, right? Probably not a concern. We take our uh, little wooden probe and we go up and it sucks the whole wooden probe in and we know that it keeps going. That might be a time to get concerned. Um, the white foam is not great for scrubbing dishes just to let you know, it kind of sucks at that. Um, but it's definitely in those areas that we might need to donate moisture. All right, so that's it for the lecture. Are there any questions about the lecture itself? So for wound vax, what type of wounds are best to use wound vax on? What would be your answer if somebody on your boards asked what type of wounds are best to use wound vax on? What do you think? Yeah, any type of wound, right? If you're looking down there, the only, so what would be, so if you've got a board question on wound vax, what would you be looking for in the actual answers that would clue you into be, if it changed question? It says, what type of wound would not be acceptable to use a wound vac on? What would you be looking for? If it's close, yeah, you probably don't wanna do that. Yeah, osteomyelitis, any of those contraindications. Right, so that's primarily the way you're gonna get your wound back questions on the boards. It's not gonna ask you, which wound do you use it on? Because it's probably gonna be an all of the above answer, right? We don't do those. But it will ask you, what type of wound do you not wanna use a wound back on? And that's where you're looking for those contraindications. Any osteomyelitis, unstable fractures, right? Increased sustained bleeding, exposed blood vessels, exposed nerves, all that you wanna be careful of using the wound back on. Um, what's the pressure most wound vacs operate at again? We just said it. 125 millimeters of mercury, good, right? If you are looking at it, and because I will say that one of the companies in town, I'm trying to think of what the other company is, it's not KCI, um, there's another company that does wound vac, I don't remember what the name of their company is right off the top of my head, they're a little small company. Um, theirs operate at 130 millimeters of mercury because they have to differentiate themselves. If I'm looking for an answer to the board question, I'm going down and looking for one that's close to blood pressure, right? That differs then with your compression stockings because your compression stockings are typically gonna be, be below what pressure? Yeah, typically 40 below. So the main thing is below your diastolic, right? So we can go, I mean, we can go up to 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury if we know that that patient's blood pressure is really high. Typically 40 is what we're gonna see. Could we use a wound vac in conjunction with compression therapy? What do you think? Yeah, right? Like say we have a sucking nasty wound in their thigh and their feet are swelling. Well, we can force some of that swelling north and some, maybe he'll, and actually a good chunk of it will probably come out through that wound, right? That's kind of a nice side effect of it. We can help get some of that swelling out of the foot and get it into that wound bed where we've got open lymph vessels and it'll just pour out in the wound and goop, gone. Um, 
I had a patient once, literally, I'm not joking, who had elephantasis, where she had really bad lymph, primary lymphedema. And I think I mentioned on this, the thing yesterday. Literally bumped her leg as we're transferring her back into the bed. And I'm saying her leg was, I, I want to say it was 38 inches at the calf around. That's pretty big, right? Almost as big as, you know, um, Jason's calves. So, um, but she had 38 inch calf because it was all swollen and we bumped it and just nicked it. Just, hey, I'm just picking, I'm just saying, I know you're working out. I know that those calves are getting bigger. Um, but bumped it and just nicked it a little bit and literally it leaked five gallons of fluid. So we ended up just propping her leg over a bucket and it just drained into the bucket. So it's amazing how bad that lymphedema can get. But we can definitely use it in conjunction with wound therapy. But areas of loss of sensation. Yeah. So in those, just that the main thing we want to be careful, if they've lost some sensation, we absolutely can still do it. Um, if I've got a patient that's got diabetic, you know, peripheral neuropathy, absolutely. We do it all the time. But we may change it more frequently. Right? We may keep an eye on it. Usually a wound vac is going to be on for, how long is a wound vac going to be on? All right, let's see those that are, have seen wound vacs. How long till we change a dressing? Yeah, two days. Three days is max. They can go three days without a change, right? And the reason we do that is, what do you think, why do we say it can go up to three days? Weekends, exactly, right? We have to be able to cover in case there's not a therapist available to change it over the weekends, right? So it's technicality. We ideally want to change it every two days. So maybe in a case where I've got a patient that's insensate, I may not change it, every day, but I'm going to check it every day to make sure that there's not something going on. And that's the nice part about these monitored wound backs is they'll tell you when something's wrong. They'll beep at you. They'll make all kinds of noise. You won't be able to escape the beeping. And they will definitely tell you when something's up in that wound back itself. What other questions? The beeping will haunt you. Yes, I guarantee once you get in the hospital, it's funny, I think my first two years working in the hospital, I'd be sitting at home and I would literally hear the beeping in my head. And I'd be like, gotta change the, gotta, oh no, okay. We, we, we don't have any problems. Yeah, the timer beeping in outpatient, I think is a little bit better than the beeping in inpatient. I'm just saying, I, I can deal with the timer beeping in outpatient. The bells, not so much. That's why I always hated when we did the bells. Any other questions I can answer? All right, I'm going to stop recording. Where's my stop recording?